Hello, everyone. Uh, it will be my privilege to moderate the second session of the NYU webinars entitled Contract Law for Arbitrators, Brazilian Law, New York Law, and Transnational Law. In today's session, we will discuss a topic of utmost interest these days, the impact of changing our circumstances in the contract domain. As we have seen last week, both Brazilian law and New York law uphold freedom of contract as a fundamental principle. That means that, as a rule, there is no room for interfering private relationships to assess why a given contract was executed, why parties choose to undertake this or that risk, why clauses have a particular wording, and so on and so forth. The contract's balance and allocation of risk is what was defined by the parties when committing to their respective, respective obligations and, as such, must be preserved. This is of particular importance in the field of long-term contracts, i.e. contracts that are executed at a certain point in time but meant to be performed at another. Considering that the future is never the same as the present, such contracts will necessarily deal with the change of circumstances. Therefore, the relevant question is when such change of circumstances matter from a legal point of view. Is compliance with what's agreed between the parties due regardless of what ends up happening in reality when the deal is given effect? Or instead, is uh, a party allowed to disregard contractual terms on the grounds that the change of circumstances was so drastic that the deal lost its purpose? To debate such a relevant issue, I have alongside with me Ina Popova, partner in the International Dispute Resolution Group of the Bevoise and Pinto, who will share with us her vast experience as counsel and arbitrator in contractual disputes. We also have today Rafael Alves, partner of MAMJ Lawyers and a respected practitioner and authority in the field of arbitration in Brazil. And as always, we also have Franco Ferrari, who you already know, who you all already know, and with whom I have the honor to coordinate this endeavor. As usual, I would like to encourage the audience to put forward any questions they may have to our panelists on our chat. That being said, I would like to start with Ina. Ina, New York law is famously known for upholding freedom of contract. Would you be so kind to provide us an overview of to what extent change of circumstances is relevant to New York law? Yes, happy to. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, pleasure to be here with you all. So, Christiana, the short answer um, is that it's very difficult for uh, change circumstances to affect the party's contract. You know, New York law typically holds parties to their bargain. Uh, New York law requires judges and arbitrators applying New York law to have perhaps a more literal interpretation, more confined to the four corners of the contract than uh, we might see in some civil law jurisdictions. So there's very little space for arbitrators to imply terms or to try to re-establish the balance between the contracting parties, some of the, the considerations that we uh, that are common and familiar to us as civil law lawyers. Um, faithful to the Anglo-American tradition, New York law provides very limited relief to a party that is affected by changed circumstances. So there are a couple of doctrines uh, and ways in which the courts think about this, um, and they can excuse performance, but only in very narrow circumstances. And the takeaway here is that the failure to perform a contract will not be excused if it is simply the result of a financial difficulty or an economic hardship, even if that hardship is so great as to potentially cause the insolvency or bankruptcy of the entity in question. So New York law will uh, perhaps come to the help of a disadvantaged party um, less frequently or less readily than Brazilian law and other laws. And so what that means for the parties uh, on the drafting side is that they should address the allocation of risk expressly in their agreements. So things like um, force majeure clauses, uh, contractual hardship clauses, um, or other similar clauses that demonstrate how the parties intended to allocate the risk under their contract and what they anticipated. And so a very practical implication is that the language of the contract 
matters a lot more under New York law than perhaps under some legal systems. So let's look at what some of the doctrines are that New York law recognizes and how they might operate. Um, there are essentially three um, uh, doctrines that I wanted to raise with you today. So first of all, frustration. And this is a, a sort of overview of, of how this can come up under New York law. So frustration of purpose, frustration of the contract first. Um, under this doctrine, a contract may be discharged for, frustra for frustration when something occurs after the formation of the contract that renders it physically or commercially impossible to fulfill the contract or transforms the obligation into a radically different one from what it was at the time it was uh, the contract was entered into. Now, uh, here the leading case is what we call the coronation cases. It's actually an English case from a very long time ago. And what happened in those cases um, is uh, that there is an apartment that was rented at a very steep price that would allow a view over the coronation ceremony for King Edward VII. And shortly before the intended ceremony, the king fell ill, and so the coronation was indefinitely postponed. And the question arose, well, do, does the renter still have to pay for this very expensive contract whose only purpose was to enable them to view the coronation procession? Um, and New York courts have referenced this case as the origin of the doctrine of frustration in the common law and essentially where it, where it arises. And we can see how that doctrine gets applied um, in more, more uh, mundane, um, modern circumstances in um, some rental agreements uh, in the context of the pandemic. So I'll, I'll start with the coronation and end of the pandemic. Um, now, concretely, how do courts approach this under New York law? So generally speaking, because it's all very fact specific, um, it's hard to draw any general principles, but some of the, some of the considerations that courts take into account are the following. Um, a frustrating event obviously has to occur after the contract has been entered into. Um, if there's an issue at the time of formation, that's that tends to uh, be analyzed as a mistake. So we have the doctrine of mistake. Um, a frustrating event must be one that is so fundamental that it's regarded by the law both as striking at the root of the contract and as being entirely beyond what was contemplated by the parties when they entered the contract. It also has to be something that is not the fault of either party. And it has to be something that makes performance impossible, illegal, or radically different from what the parties anticipated at the time they entered into it. Now, frustration does not apply where the parties have expressly dealt with the consequences of the relevant event in their contract. So, for example, if you have a force majeure clause, then uh, typically the doctrine of frustration will not apply. You would apply the party's um, a negotiated force majeure clause, um, but only if that clause makes what the courts call full and complete provision for the event. So we'll get to this later. The courts will look at, does this, does this issue fall within the scope of the negotiated force majeure clause, or are we looking at some common law doctrines like frustration and possibility? Um, frustration also doesn't apply where the event was reasonably foreseeable. Uh, now, this is sort of one of several factors, but again, the underlying question is what is the allocation of risk? And if the event was reasonably foreseeable, New York courts tend to hold that the performing party assumed the risk of that reasonably foreseeable event happening. And finally, frustration does not apply when a seller is let down by its supplier. Because again, that's something that should be reasonably foreseeable, the court's reason. And so the seller is typically considered to have assumed that risk. So it has to get the goods elsewhere or to pay damages. Now, as it uh, relates to the effects of frustration, um, when frustration occurs, the contract is discharged. So it's not merely suspended. The contract is discharged. The parties have no future obligations under it, but they are still liable for past performance. Now, we spoke a little bit about the coronation cases uh, uh, many decades ago. Now let's look at a more slightly more recent, but 1998 case called Sage Realty and Yugo Banker, where a New York court denied the frustration case. Now, in, in that case, um, there were economic sanctions uh, against Yugoslavia, and the Yugoslavian bank had entered into a commercial lease to rent space for its New York branch. After the US government issued sanctions against the Yugoslavian entities, the Yugoslavian bank's US license was revoked, 
and agents from OFAC uh, removed the bank's belongings from the leased space. Now, the bank stopped paying rent and the lessee brought suit to demand payment of the rent. And the Southern District of New York uh, rejected the bank's frustration defense. It found that sanctions were reasonably foreseeable by the bank's principles because there had been news reports prior to the lease being signed. Now, this case and the similar examples may be particularly relevant in light of recent sanctions against Russia. Now, turning now to the second doctrine, I'll be very quick on this one, is impossibility or impracticability. This one is more familiar uh, to civil law lawyers. Um, it's very, it is a very narrow uh, doctrine under New York law. It's generally limited to cases in which there's a destruction of the subject matter of the contract um, that makes it objectively impossible to perform it or sometimes when there's what we call an act of God or a law that renders performance impossible or illegal. And here again, the uh, impossibility must be as a result of an unanticipated event that could not have been foreseen or, or protected against in the contract. And just to quickly mention, impracticability in the context of sale of goods is actually a statute under New York law. So, um, oh, it's good to remind ourselves that the, the, the UCC, the UCC in New York and UCC section 2615 requires a party to establish that a contingency has occurred, the contingency has made performance impracticable, and the non-occurrence of that contingency was a basic assumption upon which the contract was made. So this is a, it's a statutory doctrine which is similar to impossibility, but it merely requires impracticability, not impossibility, and it applies in the context of the sale of goods. Um, and finally, economic hardship. Now, um, this is something we'll be hearing about a, a little more today, but under New York law, perhaps unlike other, other laws, um, a party will not be released from a contract simply because it is more expensive to perform. Um, now, the failure to perform a contract will not be excused if uh, the inability to do so or the hardship in doing so results from financial difficulty or economic hardship. Now, let's take another example here, a 1968 case concerning a garage on East 61st Street. Uh, now, here the uh, there was a hotel. A hotel and a garage had entered into a five-year contract for the garage to provide parking services to the hotel's guests. The hotel then went out of business. And here the highest court of New York, which in New York is called the Court of Appeals, it's the highest court in New York State, held that the hotel was not excused from its obligations under the contract because the hotel was going out of business, the hotel going out of business was not an unanticipated circumstance. And so no economic hardship resulted. Uh, finally, false measure. So this is this is sort of how. So how did the parties deal with this situation in their contract? Um, given that the law itself provides very limited, uh, limited grounds for um, discharging contractual obligations, what can the parties do? The first thing they can do is to draft a uh, an ironclad false measure clause. Now, um, in New York law, when we say false measure, we're talking about contractual false measure, so the interpretation of this specific clause, uh, not sort of the freestanding doctrine as one might have under other laws. So false measure disputes are typically about um, interpreting the scope of the clause in the relevant contract. And as one you can see here on the screen, um, this is from an auction agreement we all know what these things typically look like, uh, but courts will pass the specific examples that are listed and the ways in which these, these clauses are drafted. And so it can be very, very important to look at exactly what these clauses say. Um, now, the purpose of the force majeure clause, as with the general doctrine of force majeure, is to excuse or to suspend performance and to limit damages where a party has been frustrated by circumstances beyond its control. Now, in practice, um, they only really help the seller or the supplier of the performance characteristic of the contract and not the buyer whose only obligation is really to pay money. Um, now, here, uh, New York courts interpret false measure clauses narrowly. They only excuse the party's performance if the clause includes the specific event that is actually preventing the party's performance. So this is why uh, false measure clauses list a variety of events like natural disaster, war, terrorist attack, and so on, 
Um, and one might argue that given the last two years, uh, all parties would be well advised to also expressly include pandemic in that laundry list. Now, in addition to this list of specific examples, the clauses generally end with a catch-all provision uh, saying any other events that may be beyond the control of the party to be excused. Now, as you can imagine, there's a lot of litigation about uh, how far this catch-all provision extends and whether it is really effective. Um, so typically, uh, clauses will say including but not limited to or end with some language like events of either a similar or a different kind. Um, and those of us who like our Latin maxims know that, that the purpose of that is to avoid the limiting effect of the doctrine of based and generous. Now, how has this been interpreted in cases? I'll give you two examples. One, um, the second circuit in the first case, a uh, case called Jay and Contemporary Art um, from this year, uh, analyzed this uh, false majeure clause that you see above there and held that the COVID-19 pandemic and government shutdowns were covered by the clause because they were, quote, the same type of events as those expressly listed, which included, uh, without limitation, natural disaster, terrorist attacks and nuclear or chemical contamination. So the Second Circuit ruled that the uh, agreement was, was properly terminated pursuant to the language of the false majeure clause because the pandemic was in the same, same type of event as nuclear or chemical contamination. Now, second, in a different case, um, uh, this is from a couple of years ago, uh, out of New York Supreme Court, a cruise passenger sought a refund from the cruise operator when the cruise was cancelled because the operator was unable to maintain insurance. Now, the New York court found that this event was not covered by the false majeure clause, which did not mention insurance. It only mentioned things like strikes, labor difficulties or shortages and other circumstances beyond the cruise operator's control. Now, while the court did not specifically mention it in that case, you might notice that the false majeure in that instance did not include the catch-all language like without limitation. Now, um, this question here is, uh, that is interesting to think about from a doctrinal basis, which is whether unforeseeability is a requirement. Um, now, in the absence of language, the prevailing view is that unforeseeability is not required, but um, many false measure clauses exclude both foreseeable and foreseen events. And in the COVID context, a party arguing false measure with respect to a contract entered into after the pandemic might face an issue if unforeseeability were interpreted as a requirement. So finally, hardship clauses. Um, now, just like false measure uh, under New York law, there's no freestanding doctrine of hardship. Uh, this is a matter for the parties to regulate if they so wish in their contract. Um, and what you see here is just a reminder of the ICC model hardship clause, which can be adapted to the specifics of each case. Um, now, when reviewing a hardship clause, again, the analysis is principally a uh, contractual interpretation one, like for force majeure clauses. So here, arbitrators should look at whether the clause specifies the nature and the severity of the event, whether it describes the obligation that the parties are under if something comes to pass. For example, do they have to adjust the contract? Um, because the duty of good faith and fair dealing is not that well established under New York law, again, the better practice here for the parties is to spell out the details of exactly what is expected if the hardship clause were to be triggered. And lastly, arbitrators should think about whether the clause provides for the consequences of an unsuccessful negotiation. So if a party refuses to negotiate or negotiates in bad faith, uh, would that amount to a material breach that entitles the innocent party to terminate? Um, now, to distill some of these concepts we, we uh, just covered, let's take a look at a specific case that arose recently. Um, now, here we started with the coronation cases, and as I promised, we'll end with the pandemic. So we also had a lease agreement. Uh, the commercial landlord and a retail tenant entered into a lease agreement for a retail space. Um, during the pandemic, the tenant did not pay rent because of the, uh, for the duration of the shutdown imposed by the government due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, uh, as we discuss in the question here is, um, is the tenant released from the obligation to pay rent? Now, uh, the way that the court approached this is by looking first to the party's lease agreement. It concluded that none of the provisions there apply to the circumstances at hand. 
So then it moved on to consider the doctrines under the common law. It held that frustration of purpose does not apply because government closures and restrictions were not unforeseeable. It held that impossibility also did not apply because the force majeure clause contemplated disruptions due to government actions. And so that performance was not unforeseeable. And it also found that it was not objectively impossible for the tenant to pay the rent. And so ultimately what happened is that the court granted the landlord's request uh, for more than $5 million in unpaid rent. So here we are in the uh, over 200 years, first 100 years since the coronation cases. Um, if the coronation is cancelled, you might be off the hook. But if there's a pandemic, you're not off the hook. So uh, make provision in your lease agreement for, um, for specific events. And under New York law, arbitrators will need to be much more focused on what the party's contract says, um, because the available tools under the common law are far more limited. Let me stop there and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ina, for providing us an overview. Uh, such comprehensive, uh, only 15 minutes, that's quite impressive. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, I'm sure that we have a lot to discuss. I'd like now to give the floor to Rafael in order to address uh, perhaps the differences between New York law and Brazilian law while dealing with change of circumstances. Uh, what I'd like to ask Rafael precisely is whether do you understand the Brazilian law is more open to consider an allegation based on change of circumstances, or is it as, as narrow as New York law as just as Ina just showed with us? Rafael, what is your take on that? Well, first of all, let me thank Professor Ferrari and Professor Zanetti for the kind invitation. I have been following this uh, webinar series with great interest, and it is a pleasure to be here with you today alongside my colleague, Ina Popova. Now, answering uh, your question, Professor Zanetti, uh, I would not say that uh, Brazilian law is necessarily more open to consider claims or defenses based on changed circumstances. Uh, although we have significant divergences between New York law and Brazilian law on this subject, I, as I will later on in detail, uh, one possible commonality is this. Brazilian law is also strict in principle in regulating and enforcing such doctrine. Uh, what we do have under Brazilian law are uh, statutory remedies that lack under New York law, as Ina just mentioned. So if we consider the additional statutory remedies that are indeed, there are indeed other remedies under Brazilian law available to, the, to a party seeking relief in the context of change of circumstances. However, even these additional remedies are also applied narrowly. Allow me to explain these statements a little further. I have recently concluded a specific study on the Superior Court of Justice case law, also known as STJ, regarding the past 10 years on change of circumstances, particularly with respect to what we call excessive onerosity, as set forth in articles 478 to 480 of the Brazilian Civil Code. And here I have to show my gratitude to my partner, Bruno Panadella, and our associate, Patricia Pimentel, for their help with this research. We are now co-authoring a paper on this subject. We have excluded cases dealing with consumer law and other situations in which you have a certain imbalance between contracting parties. The reason is straightforward. The Brazilian judiciary tends to interfere more on these types of agreements. So in my presentation today, I will focus only on corporate transactions between sophisticated parties who knew what they were doing and what they have bargained for and finally executed. Turning to our findings, we have not found a single judgment by the STJ applying and enforcing the doctrine of excessive generosity in the past 10 years in corporate transactions between sophisticated parties. Quite to the contrary, we have found many decisions dismissing claims and defenses based on Article 478 of the Brazilian Civil Code. In my view, there are at least three reasons for that. First reason, Brazilian law sets forth specific requirement doctrine to apply. First, it only applies to agreements of 
long continued performance, not instant performance. Second, according to the law, there should be supervenient change of circumstances causing excessive onerosity to one of the parties. Third, the other party must have had significant gains deriving out of such change in circumstances. The civil code mentions expressly extreme advantage to one of the parties. When both parties lose, the doctrine does not apply. It is as simple as that. Fourth, extraordinary events must have occurred. Fifth, unforeseen events must have occurred. And last, the legal consequence is the termination of the agreement. The second reason for this significant amount of STJ decisions dismissing claims based on this doctrine is the following. Brazilian parties unfortunately use this doctrine without paying proper attention to the legal requirements that I have just mentioned. And the third reason, the STJ apply these specific requirements strictly and narrowly in corporate transactions between sophisticated parties. Of course, one can find different solutions in the Court of Appeals of different Brazilian states. Brazilian courts have different approaches and case law varies a lot from one region to, to the other, unfortunately, which causes some legal uncertainty and is detrimental to the rule of law in our country. On the other hand, one of the roles of the STJ is precisely to harmonize the application of federal law in Brazil, such as the Brazilian Civil Code, and this is the reason why we have decided to focus our research on the STJ. So this is my initial answer to your, to your question, Professor Zanetti. I would be happy to further develop uh, on other doctrines and remedies in this context, such as frustration, impossibility, force majeure, under Brazilian law, which in certain aspects could be more open and more favorable to a party seeking relief in the context of change of circumstances when compared to New York law, as described by my colleague Ina. For instance, these doctrines can be applied in principle even if the parties have not expressly agreed to them in their contracts, because the Brazilian Civil Code has default general rules in such regard. Yes, uh, you don't worry about that. I have plenty of questions to all of you. So <laughs> we certainly have a lot more to discuss. I remember quite vividly when the civil code entered into force, there was a lot of enthusiasm regarding the provisions of excessive onerosity. And I, I had by then the opinion that this, the requirements are very hard to, to be met. And a case law from STJ confirmed that. It's, it's, we, we do have this doctrine in our civil code, but it's very, very high threshold. It's not easy to, to meet the requirements. So there is, without surprise, that we see that in 10 years, and I would say even previously, we do not have as many decisions uh, uh, granting uh, termination of contract due uh, on excessive honorosity, simply because that's very hard to get in Brazilian courts. But we do now have uh, circumstances which we're uh, quite accustomed to at this juncture regarding the pandemics. Uh, there was a lot of uh, cases, and I uh, suppose that you yourself, you have dealt with such uh, kind of cases, uh, alleging that the pandemics should allow the parties to terminate a contract or to modify it to some extent. So uh, that was quite uh, uh, an issue. It has been quite an issue for the past years. And I, I think it should be an issue for the coming years as well, because we do have a lot of cases involving the pandemics. So my question to you, uh, following uh, the footsteps of Ina, is do you think that Brazilian law was well equipped to deal with these kind of cases, or uh, it would be more appropriate to have specific laws as other countries have decided, for instance, Germany, and Italy. We do have a law dealing with the pandemics, but it's, it's a very narrow provision, does not uh, address the main issues very directly. So what is your thoughts? What are your thoughts on this? Do you think that uh, this doctrine, statutory law that we have, were there su sufficient or appropriate to deal with pandemics? Or instead, we still, uh, we still are in this very narrow a corridor where we can uh, terminate the contract very, very, very rarely. Uh, please, Rafael, 
enlighten us about this? So my short answer, Professor Zanetti, is that yes, I, I do believe that Brazilian law is well equip, equipped to deal with uh, the pandemic context. The Brazilian Civil Code provides the parties with uh, different remedies to deal with this uh, context, the, the pandemic's context. And this gives me the opportunity to comment on these other doctrines that I mentioned before and the statutory remedies under Brazilian law. Uh, let me start with uh, force majeure. Contrary to what we have just heard from Ina's presentation, the Brazilian Civil Code exonerates parties from a specific legal or contract obligations, even if the, the parties have not agreed in advance on a force majeure clause. The important requirement under Brazilian law is not the unforeseeability of the event, but the inevitability of the effects and impacts of the force majeure event. That is, if one of the parties simply cannot prevent or resist the effect and impacts of the force majeure, force majeure event, such party is excluded from performing its obligations for as long as such effects and impacts last. In my view, it is clear that the COVID-19 pandemic qualifies as a force majeure event under Brazilian law with severe impacts in most contractual disputes and most of such impacts could not have been prevented or resisted by the contracting parties. And, and this understanding is actually supported by Brazilian case law. There are lots of precedents in our country in this regard. And even the, the uh, COVID law that you mentioned, Professor Zanetti, you know, this link between the COVID and force majeure is also in that specific uh, law. Even if I agree with you that you know it's it's a narrow, it's too narrow for the whole uh, for the whole context, and this is why we need to apply the doctrines of the civil code. So the real debate here is uh, on the specific effects and impacts on each contract and, and on the specific obligations of the parties. Second, excessive generosity that I just mentioned. I also understand that the doctrine of excessive generosity could be applied in the context of COVID-19 as long as the legal requirements that I have just mentioned to you are met, which is quite difficult as we just have discussed. Third, frustration and impossibility. Under Brazilian law, frustration and impossibility are not exactly the same, but some authors discuss them together. I saw that Nina, uh, Nina uh, mentioned them separately, but within a broader legal framework, we can discuss them together and which is the, this is the approach that I will take here. Uh, in certain cases, the impacts of the pandemic in specific contracts have been so detrimental as to render the agreement impossible to be performed. And when discussing possibilities, some Brazilian authors also attach an economic dimension to the doctrine uh, in a broader sense. Uh, in some cases, simply performing the contract as originally executed, disregarding the impacts of the pandemic could lead to the company's insolvency and bankruptcy. I, I heard Ina talking about the difficulty and alleging hardship, even in the context of potential insolvency and bankruptcy. Uh, it is also difficult here in Brazil to raise such argument, but it is not impossible and it could be sensitive to some judges, depending, depending on the judge and depending on the specific circumstances of the case. So I would say it appears that Brazilian courts could be more inclined to accept such arguments, economic hardship, uh, in the context of maybe frustration and impossibility, when compared to New York courts, as, as Ina mentioned. However, it should be emphasized once again that it is not, it's not an easy task to argue economic hardship under Brazilian law, the thresholds are high and courts tend to accept such arguments only in limited exceptional cases. Let's not forget, as Professor Zanetti mentioned in the beginning of this webinar about freedom of contact, contract, let's not forget that under Brazilian law, the rule is also to keep and preserve the original bargain between the parties as much as possible, particularly in the context of corporate transactions between sophisticated parties. These parties knew or should have known the risks that they were undertaking 
when executing the agreement. And in principle, they should be held accountable to that original bargain with no interference from courts or, or other tribunals. So as a general rule, judges and arbitrators should not interfere in the contract, contractual balance, second guessing what the parties would have wanted in terms of risk allocation when, when circumstances change. If the parties have undertaken specific risk, judges and arbitrators should hold the parties accountable. On the contrary, if the parties have not undertaken such risk, then these doctrines and remedies that have been discussed in here should apply. So this is my answer to you, Professor Zanetti, in the second question. Thank you, I have a third one. <laughs> and it also regards the pandemics. Uh, I understand the pandemics is a starting point of the discussion, but uh, that's near that. Of course, at the beginning, the pandemics was inevitable and unforeseeable, but then uh, after two years, we have different type of cases regarding the pandemics already. So uh, to simply state that pandemics was something that we're not prepared to, to face, that's, that's a starting point, as I said, but that's not, not the whole story. So I, I'm now, if I may, I'd like to, to give you perhaps a, a, a task that it's not very uh, easy to, to say right from the outset, but uh, I would like to know what do you think about the case that Ina mentioned regarding the pandemics in the U.S.? Uh, there was a rent, the rent uh, uh, had a problem because of the pandemics was very likely, was not uh, uh, possible for this renter to use the, the store that he has rented. I think there was a Hugo Boss store, as I said, the name of the parties, it was a fancy store. And he said, okay, I don't want to pay the rent. That's your problem. You, you still have to pay. But there was a clause involved. There was a discussion regarding contract interpretation. So I, I was wondering, how do you see this uh, same case with the information you have under Brazilian law? Would we uh, reach a different solution or should we decide in the same fashion as New York court has decided? Uh, that, I agree that it is a difficult question under, under Brazilian law. Uh, my preference would be to have a short and easy answer, but there is not. So I will give you the answer that I, I, I in my view, should be the answer according to Brazilian law, but I, I will tell you it's not what we have been seeing in Brazilian courts. So there's a difference between what the law says and what the, the, the law in the books and the law in action. The law in the books, uh, Article 393 of the Brazilian Civil Code dealing with force majeure events states that the debtor is not responsible for the damages arising out, arising out of force majeure events unless the debtor has expressly undertaken such risk. So under Brazilian law, parties are free to contract uh, the risks involved in a force majeure event. Of course, you can argue whether or not the worst pandemic in our century would be within that uh, clause, even if you have that catch-all provision that uh, Ina mentioned. But let's let's take at least uh, as a hypothetical that parties are free to contract around that risk. They can undertake that risk. If you have a contract in which the parties have done so, the easy answer would be uh, judges should uh, apply the clause. And, and held and, and hold the parties accountable to that, to that uh, risk, original risk undertaking. However, we're discussing here uh, commercial rentals. It's, uh, it's, it's not within the, the range of corporate transactions not interfered by Brazilian courts that I mentioned before. <laughs> it's something different. So uh, we have a specific law on rentals, residential and commercial. And this is a part of our law in which there is a lot of court interference, even for commercial rentals. Maybe less interference for commercial renters, but still courts interfere a lot in commercial renters, rentals in Brazil. So number one. Number two, particularly in the, in the COVID uh, context, there has been a lot of interference by courts in 
commercial rentals in Brazil. So you have you have precedents all over Brazil uh, allowing uh, tenants to just suspend payments of rentals, regardless of the contract. Uh, for as long as the pandemic was so back then in 2020, uh, there were there were decisions saying you, you don't need to pay your rent if if the if there's a shutdown if there's a lockdown in your city, your city cannot open. You don't need to pay the landlord. I'm not even looking at the contract. So unfortunately, in Brazil, uh, some courts, some judges are more inclined to interfere in those type of arrangements because they are more sensitive to our political and social context. I, I'm not. I'm not insensible to that. I understand the judges, but for a practitioner, for a law professor, it's always hard to talk about Brazilian law when you have something in the books and a different thing in action in Brazilian court. So uh, commercial rentals in the pandemic context, I would say that case that, that Ina mentioned, most likely the result would be different. They would say, you don't need to pay during the shutdown or during the lockdown. But we still have to see what the Superior Court of Justice will decide when these cases get there. Because we do what we do have most of our decisions from the first instance. And then we have to see the Court of Appeals, and then we have the Superior Court of Justice, which likely will take some time, but we will get there. Let us see how they address these cases. And of course, the clauses matter immensely. Uh, whether they have acknowledged and accept some risk, it's one issue. If they haven't done so, it's a different set of rules, and we do have. Uh, statutory law regarding force majeure and likely uh, New York law. But let's move to the uh, transnational space. It's it's always uh, fascinating to see how we could address these questions from a more broader perspective. Uh, I would like to discuss this uh, issue uh, with Franco, of course, regarding the Unidroit principles. Unidroit principles are very popular uh, uh, worldwide and they're very well written. Then they aim to provide appropriate legal rules to international commercial contracts. Uh, it's a, a scholarly work, and that has some advantages because you're not pressed by the issues that usually parliaments have to deal with. So aim to provide the better rules that we can uh, develop as scholars. So uh, would you be so kind, Franco, to enlighten us how the Unidroit principles deals with the change of circumstances. I would like to know your opinion whether this is a good uh, ruling on this or should be improved to some extent. Please. So thank you um, to everybody involved and thank you uh, for giving me the floor now. So my remarks, as mentioned by Professor Zanetti, will focus on how force majeure clauses and economic hardships are dealt with, as mentioned by the Unidroit principles of international commercial contracts. Now the principles, and this is a starting point, provide a well delineated legal framework composed of provisions relating to force majeure on the one hand and hardship on the other hand. The existence of the differentiated set of provisions suggests in my opinion that these two doctrines should be kept distinguished. Although of course they do present common features, at least some common features. As stated, for example, in Chevron Corporation v. Texaco Petroleum and Texaco Petroleum, sorry, v. Ecuador, with express reference to the Unidra principles, the institution of force majeure, like that of hardship, is designed to distribute between the parties in a fair and equitable manner the losses and gains resulting from an unforeseeable event. Now, this cannot, however, exempt the interpreter, in my opinion, from distinguishing between the two cases in view especially of the quite different consequences that flow from them. Now, indeed, as pointed out both by commentators and by the drafters of the UNIDRA principles themselves, there may be factual situations qualifying at the same time as cases of hardship on the one hand and force majeure on the other. In this type of cases, it is for the party affected by the event in question to decide what remedy actually to pursue 
if it were to invoke force majeure, it would do so with a view to the result that it would be exempt from liability for non-performance, of course. Now, if on the other hand, it were to invoke hardship, it would do so primarily with a view to renegotiating the terms of the contract so as to enable the contract to be kept alive, albeit, of course, on revised terms. Now, with regard to force majeure specifically, the relevant provision is 717, which, according to one commentator, does not really present special features. The defaulting party is exempt from liability if it proves that the non-performance was due to an impediment arising from circumstances beyond its control and that it was not reasonably required to foresee such an impediment at the time of the conclusion of the contract or to avoid or overcome the impediment itself or its consequences. Now, as a look at the Unilex database shows that over the years, a number of arbitral tribunals and courts have been tasked indeed with shedding light on the requirements which I've just referred to, from the concept of impediment to the concept of unforeseeability and that of impossibility of avoiding or overcoming the impediment or its consequence. Now, since the health situation has been mentioned now, allow me to um, refer to one decision, a Russian decision, which I want to cite because it seems useful to show that some of the measures taken to stem the consequences of this pandemic, which we're living through today, may indeed constitute an event of force majeure within the meaning of Article 717 of the UNIDRA principles. Now, in that case, the tribunal held that the penalty sought from the defendant was not due because late delivery was caused by the fact that the defendant had been subjected to investigations by a government agency. In support of its decision, the court referred to Article 717 of the UNIDRA principle, which I've mentioned now on various occasions, a provision interpreted by the Arbitral Tribunal as meaning that to qualify as force majeure, the impediment must be extraordinary and unavoidable, taking into account, of course, the circumstances of the specific case. And then it refers to such as floods, earthquakes, and other similar natural, natural calamities, acts of war, epidemics, and so forth. Now, the government investigation was not considered to meet these requirements. The reference to epidemics as an event of force majeure is, however, of particular importance today, because as we know, a pandemic such as the COVID-19 pandemic is nothing more than an epidemic spreading over several countries and continents. Thus, we should be able to conclude that it cannot be excluded a priori at least that pandemics and their consequences, such as lockdowns and of course other restrictive measures, may constitute events of force majeure. Still, I want to be very clear, this does not mean that one can automatically equate the measures taken with force measure events, of course, but only that a priori there are no obstacles to considering them as such. It is always necessary to take into account the circumstances of the specific case and verify, and this holds true also in respect, for example, of Article 79 of the States Convention, whether all requirements for exemption from liability do exist. It is necessary by way of example to have regard to the type of government measures taken, the time at which they occurred and in which place, in the country of the obligee or that of the obligor, the type of obligation due so that it will be more difficult for the obligor of a monetary obligation than, for example, the obligation to deliver goods to be produced to be exempted from liability. Also, the time of conclusion of the contract, and this basically was what Professor Zanet implies, which affects the foreseeability required under Article 717 of the UNIDRA principles, and certainly makes exemption more difficult in the event of conclusion of a contract after the outbreak of the pandemic, concluded, for example, with the mistaken belief that the pandemic would actually not have lasted so long or would not have led 
to the consequences which it did actually lead to. But the UNIDRA principle, and this I mentioned earlier, also govern hardship following a change of circumstances occurring after the conclusion of the contract. Although, this should be very clear, the starting point of the UNIDRA principle is that of Pacta Sunt Servanda. Indeed, according to Article 621, where the performance of a contract becomes more onerous for one of the parties, that party is nevertheless bound to perform its obligations subject to the provisions on hardship. So in order to ensure that it is not always necessary to sacrifice other principles equally worthy of protection, the UNIDRA principles themselves provide that the principle pacta sunt servanda is actually not absolute. Although it is certainly not of secondary ranks, of course. If one considers that the exceptions to this principle are limited and must be, in my opinion, interpreted restrictively. This relativity of the principle pacta sunt servanda is justified by the desire to accommodate in the most appropriate way the instances of reliance on the continuity of the relationship and the need to safeguard the balance of interest reached and expressed in the contract, both of which emerge in particular force in international trade, of course. If a party is able to prove hardship, that party first has the right to request the renegotiation of the contract under Article 623. If the parties do not reach agreement on the matter within a reasonable period of time, any one of the parties may, and actually may, irrespective of the reasons for the failure to reach agreement, ask the court to terminate the contract at a date and on the terms to be fixed, or to adapt the contract so as to restore its original equilibrium. Now, hardship with the above-mentioned consequences occurs in case of occurrence of events which fundamentally alter the equilibrium of the contract, which I just mentioned, either because of an increase in the cost of the performance of one of the parties, or because of a decrease in the value of the counterperformance, and the events occur or become known to the disadvantaged party after the conclusion of the contract. Also, for there to be hardship under the UNIDRA principles, it is required that the events could not reasonably have been taken into account by the disadvantaged party at the time of the conclusion of the contract. That the events are beyond the control of the disadvantaged party and the risk of such event had not been assumed by the disadvantaged party and we heard our previous speaker refer to a similar concept as well. This means, to just give another COVID-related example, that the pandemic and the measures taken by the various governments may, yes, well be considered events altering the aforementioned balance, even in a fundamental way, at least with respect to contracts before its occurrence. Also in this context, the moment of the conclusion of the contract is relevant as it is to determine whether this force majeure. As also indicated, actually, in a recent note of the UNIDRA Secretariat on the UNIDRA Principles of International Commercial Contracts and the COVID-19 health crisis. So there's a document on that. Still, other elements must also be taken into account to decide whether economic hardship exists. In this context as well, um, a one-size-fits-all answer is, in my opinion, inappropriate, as in the force majeure context I mentioned earlier. The specifics of the case will be relevant, including, again, the place of performance of the unfulfilled obligation, the type of performance owed, the location of the contracting party's place of business, for example, as well, of course, as many other elements. And I stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Franco. Uh, I, I agree entirely with you when you said that we have to differentiate force majeure doctrine and hardship doctrine. I remember of a Brazilian book of 1958, which is quite old book, and the book was called Force Majeure and in Provision. <laughs> so it's, it's uh, uh, by then it was understood that 
the two uh, doctrines we dealt with at the same time. But we have evolved much uh, from uh, the beginning of the second part of last century. And I think there are commonalities in these institutes, but there are very, very important differences between them. And I, I was remembering something that I heard from a professor of Latin that prop Eden is not Eden. Almost the same, not the same. So I think this is quite the situation that we have here. But we, we do have uh, the last version of the new draw principles uh, of 2016. So it's quite new from legal point of view. And we do have the set of rules that are very interesting. But you know, draw principles, uh, uh, as bright as they may be, they're always soft law. <laughs> and uh, I like to, to discuss not only soft law with you, but also hard law. And we, we do have, uh, in Brazil, as you know, uh, the CISG in force. So this CISG, uh, likely the Eurodrop principles, a much older text. Uh, it, it, it's from 1980 and had some provisions dealing with a lot of issues, but inevitably it has gaps. And being in international law or transnational law, to be more precise, perhaps, it's very hard to amend the CISG. Uh, we do not see that happening in the near future. So I think it is uh, safe to assume that there are gaps in the CISG regarding hardship. Uh, at least, to, uh, as far as I understand, most commentators acknowledge the existence of such gaps. I'd like to know what, uh, how do you see uh, the interplay between Eurodraw principles and CISG? Uh, do you think that the Eurodraw principles could play some role to supplement the CISG while dealing with change of circumstances, or we simply have to deal with changes of circumstances within the framework of CISG with the rules that are already there? Uh, how do you see this? So thank you. Now, as regards hardship under the CSG, it is, as you mentioned, an issue very much debated in legal writing due to the fact that the CSG does not expressly deal with hardship. Now, this makes possible different um, interference, inferences about whether hardship excuse is actually available under the CSG. According to one view, for example, the lack of a specific set of rules concerning the doctrine of hardship is to be understood as removing it from the scope of application of the CSG. And I have to say there seems to be support in case law for this view. An Italian decision of January 1993 rendered by the district court in Monza needs to be mentioned here. Similarly, a Greek decision of 2006 held that the CSG Article 79 on force measure does not entitle the promisor to be released from its contractual obligation to the change of economic background on which the parties relied for the conclusion of the contract. But according to a different view, and we're getting closer to your questions, of course, hardship, including financial hardship, is implicitly somehow included within the scope of Article 79, basically on force majeure. So that a party claiming hardship can receive an exemption from liability and damages for non-performance on the same terms as one who claims exemption based on physical and absolute inability to perform. Now, according to yet another view, hardship is not expressly dealt with in Article 79, but it is still dealt with, covered somehow by the CSG. For adherence to this third position, hardship falls within the questions that Article 7.1 of the CSG um, calls those governed by the Convention, but that are not expressly settled in. Now, these questions are, according to that provision, Article 7, to be dealt with or to be settled in conformity with the general principles on which the CSG is based, or only absent these principles in conformity with the applicable law by virtue of the rules of private international. Now, in light of this, Article 79 of the CSG, again, even if not directly applicable, serves as the source of a general principle that allows relief in hardship situations. Now, this view, too, finds support in case law, including in case law stemming, actually, from at least two Supreme Courts, namely those of Belgium and France. Now, according to another view, the CSG does not at all tackle the issue, thus leaving it to domestic law identified through 
private international law analysis. How do then the UNIDA principles come into play? Now, the UNIDA principles come into play in the third of these solutions. I referred to two Supreme Court decisions, a Belgian one and a, a French one, which, in my opinion, unfortunately, claim that one can, for this issue, resort to the solution to be found in the UNIDA principles. So the Supreme Courts of France and Belgium stated that in order to determine what consequences may derive from an assertion of economic hardship, one can turn to the UNIDRA principles. I think that that is not really the correct approach. That's quite interesting. And perhaps that allows us to focus on a, a different topic, but obviously related to what have been discussed so far regarding the consequences of hardship. Because uh, the first part of the story is to analyze whether we have the all the requirements to establish hardship. But then we do have another uh, decision to make is what happens next. And you just mentioned that uh, new drop principles, they uh, <coughs> have to negotiate. They have to try to find solutions themselves. And if that's not possible, then if I'm not mistaken, then uh, the adjudicator can terminate the contract. Uh, but I will ask this question first to you, Franco, and then I would like to hear Ina about that as well. Do you think that this uh, provision, regardless, irrespective of whether this is in contract or it's in the law, uh, binding the parties to negotiate or to renegotiate their contract, do you think that this provision is effective? This is a good provision. It's worth to have such kind of provision uh, in the law. For instance, in Brazilian law, we do not have that. Some authors say that uh, this is, could be established uh, through good faith, but there's a lot of opposition. The main scholarly work thinks otherwise. Uh, and I agree with this second vision. But uh, regardless whether this is in statutory law or in the contract, uh, my point is perhaps a more practical one. Uh, uh, obligating the parties to renegotiate the contract. Uh, do you think this is effective? What happens if the negotiation does not result in anything? Uh, can we move forward to establish a different <laughs> contract or, or perhaps we just end up having termination that we have from the beginning? <laughs> so uh, I think this is a valid question, perhaps less from a theoretical point of view and more from a practical point of view. I'd like to hear you on this. And then if Ina could comment from the New York law perspective, I would appreciate that very much. Let's be serious. In my opinion, the parties will attempt to renegotiate the contract irrespective of whether the UNIDA principle impose such an obligation or not. So in real life, I am sure that prior to starting a proceedings, whether it's an arbitral proceedings or prior to starting litigation, the parties will have come together and will have at least tried to find a way to get out of this. So that's my first point. I think that, for example, under the CSG, resort to the UNIDRA principle is not to be had. The CSG, for example, is very clear. It says that the general principles have to be elaborated, identified out of the CSG itself, derived from the CSG itself, meaning that no resort to external principles needs to be had if the CSG tackles an issue. Also, those people who agree that somehow economic hardship is dealt with by the CSG's Article 79, either because it somehow falls under its scope or because that provision that's for the general principle need to be consistent. They need to say, if we are looking into Article 79 as somehow encompassing a general principle, we look at the requirements set forth by that general principle, but in my opinion, we should also look at the consequences these consequences have to then be derived from Article 79. So looking into Article 79 to determine whether um, hardship exists at all, and then look, turning for the consequences to a different set of rules, an external set of rules, is, in my opinion, not necessarily very consistent. This would be my answer. It's, it, it's a long way. It's a long way. You have to establish a very... Uh, complex requirements 
and then you have to find a, a good solution to, to this. It's, it's not very surprising, I would say, because once the departing point is freedom of contract, it should be hard to interfere in the contract domain. It, 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 it's a consequence of adopting a position that upholds freedom of contract. So it's, it's a lot of issues to discuss. I think that uh, after uh, we have seen all the, the cases regarding the pandemics, we will have a very, very elaborated case law and we could establish many differences between those cases. That would be very enlightening. Uh, and I, I'm starting to regret that we only have four webinars prepared, Franco. I think we should have more because these topics are so interesting. Uh, perhaps we should have a more ambitious program. Uh, uh, I hope that the audience agrees. <laughs> May I add one thing, um, Cristiano? And just yes, to course. give you an idea. There is a very interesting decision. Um, it is called BST. Banco Santander Tota SA V um, TCA, TCS, these are transport companies. And um, it is in the High Court of Justice, Queen's Bench Division Commercial Court, and it's a decision from 2016. Why do I bring it up here? In that case, the issue was whether the choice of law in favor of English law could be upheld. English law has a rule similar to the one in a um, of course, exposed, meaning it says you made a bet, you lose a bet, your problem. Why? Because the parties were all from Portugal. Then the court had to look into whether Portuguese law could be overridden by a choice in favor of English law. And there were issues with the internationality of the relationship under then Rome Convention, not yet Rome 1 regulation. Why do I say that? Because that court stated that the Portuguese rules of church change of circumstances are mandatory law. So under Portuguese law, for example, the parties cannot do what Ina rightly proposed, meaning that they should somehow elaborate or find or draft a contract rule out of certain relationships or issues. Under Portuguese law, the rule on change of circumstances, according to this decision, is actually mandatory and parties cannot get out of it by contract. If at all, and that was the issue in that case, they can get out of it um, by choosing a foreign law if certain conditions are met. Well, we have had a similar discussion in Brazil. Uh, there were positions in both sides, as quite often happens in, in legal writings. Uh, but after the so-called Economic Freedom Act, I think it's very hard to argue that parties are not allowed to take whatever risks they want in Brazilian contracts. So there's some changes in Brazilian law, and I think it points towards uh, very much of upholding freedom of contract and allowing parties to exclude the intervention of courts in case of change of circumstances. Uh, it's still some opinions both sides, but I think afterwards, uh, this Economic uh, Freedom Act, which is quite an odd name, I must say. Uh, <clears throat> it's not like that we do not have, we did not have a freedom of contract before, but regardless, uh, I think it's it's more um, protective of party autonomy that at least in the text itself than it was considered by some before. But I'd like to, to hear Ina on this. Now, are you enthusiastic about this obligation in a contract, uh, not talking about uh, the party's uh, attempt to reach uh, uh, an agreement that, that says, I agree entirely with Franco again. That's very likely will happen most of cases, but that's outside of legal framework. It's up to the parties to decide whether they would be able to reach a new agreement under the new circumstances that they are facing. But I'm, I'm thinking about uh, the clause itself. Do you think this is a very effective clause or it's just uh, uh, wasting uh, some piece of, of paper. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I can be enthusiastic about good faith while also thinking that it might be ultimately not very effective. Um, so, look, under New York law, there's very little case law on this because these kinds of clauses are not very common at all. 
um, again, this is a, you know, from the from the English tradition, we take the the idea or at least the concept that agreements to agree are not really enforceable in the first place. Uh, New York law is a little bit different, though. It's a little more generous because it does recognize uh, the duty of good faith and fair dealing, and it does recognize that in certain circumstances, the parties have have an obligation to negotiate in good faith. Um, the problem, though, is how do you prove bad faith? Uh, and we all know this is very, very difficult to prove in practice. It's a very high standard. And even in the rare cases where it succeeds, how do you establish the measure of damages? And you know, courts here have held that really, you're, even if you manage to establish a breach of the obligation to negotiate in good faith, um, the most you can recover is the wasted costs. So not the expectation that you would have had had you reached the ultimate agreement, but any cost that you might have wasted in negotiating with a party that was not negotiating in bad faith. So um, we don't see these clauses that often in contracts. They don't come before the courts that often. They succeed even more rarely. Um, so uh, overall, it, I suppose it can't hurt, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't rely on it. I think there are other ways of of drafting the contract um, in better ways that will hopefully be more effective for the parties. It's quite uh, interesting at the end of the day because we call this uh, sort of indemnification negative interest. Uh, this is, uh, I know you're familiar with that, but just clarify to our audience. This is technology that is, comes from German law and we use that in Brazil. It's very interesting from uh, uh, scholar point of view, but the parties are not very happy when they are able only to recover negative interest. So uh, this, <laughs> yes. these values are very minor usually. Um, you, of course, you have expenses and then you have to indemnify something, but um, that's not much. That's not much. It's not very relevant from an economic point of view. So you, you could have this kind of solution, but Parties usually, at least from my experience, they do not consider that very helpful. <laughs> no, I mean, it's a, really a pyrrhic victory when you prevail on the breach of contract claim and then you're awarded nominal damages of $1, right? Yes, you've established a breach, but you, you can't, can't recover any damages. Uh, not, not particularly helpful, I think, um, for the parties. So the principle might be there, but in practice, we don't see it that often. Yeah, it's... it's uh... We always have to consider very uh, heavily the differences between uh, on legal theories, which might be very interesting, and what are we providing to the parties in a given contract. So this is a very uh, rich discussion from a uh, legal standpoint of view, but sometimes awarding only uh, what we call negative interest is <laughs> it's not the solution that the parties want. But that's that's the law is what it is, and, and I like lock in the books, by the way. So uh, what I was about to ask Rafael is uh, we do have uh, still have some time uh, before I give the floor to Franco to close the session. I'd like to ask a question to Rafael regarding precisely the consequences of hardship under Brazilian law. Uh, there is some debate, uh, uh, and I have an opinion of this, as Rafael already know. There is some uh, debate. Uh, uh, regarding the consequences of hardship in accordance with articles uh, 478 and 479. Uh, the law says that only termination is allowed. Uh, if you face a case, a case of hardship and all the requirements are met, it's always good to emphasize that, if all requirements are met, then the party is allowed to terminate the contract. Uh, some say that uh, you could also amend the contract or ask the amendment from the contract through uh, the judiciary or to arbitration. Uh, I'd like to, to know how do you see this? Do you think that Brazilian law allows the arbitrator to focus in our subject here today? Do you think that Brazilian law allows the arbitrator to modify or terminate the contract in the absence of a, a clause in the sense, of course, I'm talking about statutory law. And have you uh, ever seen an arbitrator amend the contract in your experience as a lawyer and as arbitrator as well? Uh, based on such an article in Brazilian law. Rafael, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor. No, I haven't seen yet uh, an amendment of a contract by virtue of Article 478. As I mentioned in my presentation, I, in principle, I agree with you. I think the legal consequence of all those requirements to be met, 
the legal consequence is termination of the agreement because this is what it is in the in our civil code as, as simple as that but yes some authors understand that uh, besides termination uh, claim and plaintiff can uh, uh, argue and ask for contract revision or amendment and we can also find some precedents in that regard some judges agree that you can also ask for a contract revision and not termination i think uh, brazilian law has a different uh, solution which is in article 479 that you also mentioned professor zanetti that article which is the following one from 78 of course uh, states that determination can be avoided if the defendant offers to modify the conditions of the agreement, which I think it's a wise solution by our law, because then you know, the, the, the plaintiff claimant asks for termination, which he is entitled to under the uh, civil code, and then the defendant may say, look, uh, to avoid termination, I'm ready to offer you this. So it's, a, it's an offer uh, in the courts by the defendant to uh, change the circumstances, to change the conditions equitatively, as the law mentions. I haven't seen this, this provision being applied in practice, but it is a solution. I think the uh, Brazilian legislator has been wise. The, the, the solution by Brazilian law is wise because even for those authors saying that a judge or an arbitrator could actually amend the contract, the agreement, even for those who support this, this position, it is very hard for the adjudicator, be it a judge or, or an arbitrator, to reestablish the balance, the contractual balance and the original bargain. I think Ina mentioned that in her presentation as well. Uh, you start second guessing several things but you know to put the arbitrator or the or the judge in the party's position as an impartial adjudicator it's it's very very hard to find uh, the proper solution for that amendment because you know we have, we have been as practitioners who have been involved several times hundreds of times in negotiations of settlements and of contracts we know that those negotiations are hard and uh, parties reach certain balance and then they decide to execute. You know, it's, it's not always clear. Look, if you give me this, I'll give you that. And then we have the balance, the perfect balance. This is not how it works, right? So if you, if you take one clause out or if change of circumstances just makes one clause completely impractical, then the judge will say, look, it's okay if you don't have that clause because I'll make this clause better. That's, that's very hard to do for a judge or an arbitrator. So even if uh, you agree to those authors and judge saying, look, contract revision is possible, still in practice, it's hard. I, I would like to, to say that we have different models in the civil law world to deal with change of circumstances. And uh, Brazil, Brazil follows very closely the Italian model on this. We have, do have another model, it's German law. The German law clearly says that you are allowed to, uh, the courts are allowed actually, to uh, amend the contract to some extent. But I, I would say that it's much easier to say than to do such a thing. Uh, I have faced myself the situation where the, claw, the parties have decided that the arbitrators, they uh, did have the power to change the contract, so there's no issue regarding our statutory law. The parties allow and recognize that. And then we have to decide it. what will then be the terms of the contract under the new circumstances. And it was a nightmare. <laughs> it's, it's very, very complicated to decide. Well, perhaps we could this, uh, think of a simpler solution for consumer law, for example, but in commercial, in the field of commercial contracts, I think that everyone that has an experience with that uh, realize that those negotiations are complicated and how do you put yourself in the situation to decide what would be the actual balance or the fair balance between the obligations of the parties under these new circumstances i think this is a 
task very, very hard to do, very, very hard to do. Uh, and I would like to, to hear Franco as a uh, well-known comparatist. Franco, uh, am I exaggerating? Do you think that no, the yeah, is yeah, clearly that was very easy? Am, am I missing something? No, the one thing I wanted to point out is that recently, however, the trend went into the direction we're talking about, meaning legislators promoting rules that do allow the adjudicator actually to somehow redraft the contract. You yourself, um, Cristiano, referred to the German Civil Code. If you look at Article 313, that is clearly a provision that allows, and it's a recent, rather recent provisions, that allows the adjudicator to redraft the contract. But more recently even, Article 1195 of the French Civil Code has actually codified the Théorie de l'imprévision. So that is something that is more recent. Now, I wonder whether this reflects a trend, considering that we are talking about the two paradigms of civil law systems. So meaning one is the German one, so you have the Germanic legal family, and then you have the French one. Maybe the fact that these two legal systems have introduced the possibility to readapt meaning allowing the adjudicator to readapt the contract, maybe that is to be seen as something that will push other countries um, to do the same. Um, I was sitting as an arbitrator in a case where German law was applicable, and we were able to identify a different price. The price has changed from €4.63 Euro for one item to 43 cents. So that it's a big difference. Um, that's a big difference. It related to um, the economic crisis in 2017, uh, seven and eight. And we, I think, were able to find a solution. Not easy, but you know, one has to apply the law. German law was applicable, and therefore we were allowed to do it. Actually, one of the parties asked us to do it. Thank you. This is a very uh, insightful comment, Franco, because uh, perhaps we should not expect that from French law. As we know, French law resisted for decades, uh, perhaps for centuries, to uh, adopt some kind of solution for hardship. There was solutions for hardship in the field, of, I think, of uh, administrative contracts, but not for private contracts. And then, in the last uh, reform of the French Civil Code, they not only allowed hardship, but including the solution of uh, adjust the contract, which is quite remarkable. I I'm curious how uh, French case law will develop in this sense. Uh, I'm, I'm perhaps, uh, I'm accustomed to Brazilian law, obviously, uh, but I'm a bit skeptical regarding this uh, alternative that is in German civil code and now in French civil code. I'm not unhappy that we do not have that in Brazilian uh, civil code. I'm, I'm a bit uh, concerned about how uh, courts in general will deal with if they had such a power, which I don't think they do under present uh, Brazilian law. And I'd like to correct myself. I tried to learn several languages in my life, and I, 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 I work and say at this juncture that I speak badly several of them, uh, uh, despite Italian, that I'm very proud to speak very good Italian, as we have already uh, tried to prove to Franco. But I translated uh, wrongly the title of the book that I mentioned. I, I committed a mistake. Uh, the actual title, title in English would be Force Majeure and Unforceability. I said in Prevision, I think it was uh, somehow French <laughs> come across of my mind. So uh, it's good to have the opportunity to amend the mistakes. And I'm doing that at the end of the webinar. Uh, before I give the floor to Franco to close the session, I'd like to uh, uh, heartily thank uh, Rafael Aina for joining us and the arbitration channel, uh, Canal Arbitragem here in Brazil, to broadcast it. I think it's uh, a very welcome partner to our endeavor and we're happy to have you, you alongside with us. So from my part, thank you all. Uh, it was very illustrative. I'm still regretting that we only have four webinars and I'll give the floor to Franco to close our session. Thank you. So thank you very much, of course. As you all know, this is a four series um this is a webinar four series and um, they all go back to an idea that professor zanetti had and i'm very happy to be able to piggyback on it so thank you cristiano thank you to everyone for um 
looking into New York law. On the one hand, Brazilian law, I thank you, and we clearly saw that you know the law. We know that we will come to you if we have questions. And um, I invite you to join us for the next two. We will have one uh, next Tuesday on Good Faith, and um, we have a last one on the 13th of May. Thank you to everyone. Thank you for Arbitration Channel. I hope to see you soon. Most importantly, however, stay safe. Bye. Bye. Hi, everyone. Thank you.